Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of uh, the FMS seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Subramaniam Duvari, who is an assistant professor of aerospace engineering at the Indian Institute of Science uh, in Bangalore in India, where he leads the turbulent shear flow physics and engineering laboratory. He obtained his uh, uh, master's and PhD degrees in space engineering and aeronautics from Caltech. Uh, and today he's going to talk about dynamics of flow answeriness in high speed double cone fan cylinders. So, over to you, Subram. Uh, all right, Vishal. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction. Um, I hope my audio is coming through. Um, should be. Yeah, all good. Um, so, uh, it's, it's great. Uh, to be able to share with you all some of the research that, uh, that we've been doing in my group uh, at the Indian Institute of Science. So I thank the organizers of this uh, nice seminar series for, for the opportunity. Uh, if you're wondering about this, uh, this photograph on my title slide, this building, this is the faculty hall on our campus. It is the oldest building uh, at the Indian Institute of Science. So this building was uh, completed in about the year 1908, 1909, and the Institute, institute formally started functioning in the year uh, 1909. Um, okay, um, so as you can guess uh, from the title of my talk, I'm going to be talking about two um, uh, canonical flows. So high-speed flow or double cones and, and also uh, high-speed cylinder wakes. So here's a, a little uh, teaser for what's in store over the next uh, 50, 55 minutes. So what you're looking at on your screen are two high-speed Schlieren videos, which have been slowed down uh, for playback. Uh, on the right is uh, a very unsteady flow or a, or a double cone geometry. So this is a, a cone and a cylinder. Um, and on the left is, is the near wake region of um, of a high-speed cylinder, both the flows are at, at Mark six. Uh, so in in the cylinder wake, you can you can also see there is uh, you can sort of um, make out coherent oscillation. So this is what I'm going to be uh, talking about. Um, but before I get into the the details, I'd like to take a minute to uh, to acknowledge my students and and postdocs who uh, worked on this uh, project. So this is uh, us. We are the turbulent shear flow physics and engineering laboratory at the Indian Institute of Science. Um, our research interests are uh, spread across both um, high and low speed flows, so uh, subsonic all the way to hypersonic. Although at this at this moment, predominantly the interest is in in high speed flows. So about I would say about eighty to eighty five percent of our current research efforts are in in high speed flows. Um, all right. Um, so the double cone uh, uh, experiments and and work on this double cone problem were done by uh, Vaishak and. Gaura, who were uh, until recently postdocs in the group, uh, and also Akshay, who recently uh, uh, defended his uh, master's thesis uh, at IIC. So this is uh, Vaishak, Akshay, and Gaura. Um, and the cylinder wake uh, work was uh, done by my PhD student uh, Premika. This is this is uh, her. Uh, okay, so let's get into the uh, the details of, of of the double cone problem. Uh, so here's the here's the double cone geometry. This is a canonical geometry in, in high speed flows. It's been around uh, uh, for several decades. Um, the geometry itself is is fairly easy to describe. So you have a, a, a this is an axisymmetric body. So you have a four body which is a right circular cone uh, with half angle theta one uh, and slant length l one, and that is followed by a half body which is also a right circular cone with the same axis as the four body. Uh, and the half body, a half angle is theta two, and the portion of the second cone which projects out into the flow has a slant length L two. So for this geometry, um, you can completely describe this geometry by uh, four uh, dimensional length scales. So which means if you use three non-dimensional uh, parameters, you can completely describe the geometry. So it's common to take these parameters as theta one, theta two, and the ratio of the slant lengths L two and L one. So theta one, theta two are the are the two uh, half angles, as you can see in this um, in this figure. Um, of course, these are the three geometric parameters. In addition, there are there are the flow parameters too, which are uh, in our case uh, uh, the Mach number, the flow Mach number, and the flow Reynolds number. 
All right. Uh, so, like I said, this 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 problem has been around for a while, and um, uh, several researchers have looked at the double cone problem for a variety of reasons. Uh, so, here I will uh, not attempt to make a comprehensive um, uh, review of of the literature for this problem. Instead, I'll restrict myself to uh, regimes of this uh, three-dimensional parameter space where the double cone flow exhibits uh, very interesting large scale um, unsteady uh, flow dynamics, right? So even in this sort of subspace, um, uh, a particular case of the, of the double cone, which is commonly known as the spike cylinder, uh, has received plenty of uh, attention. Um, so um, here on the bottom left is, is the spike cylinder geometry. So the fore body is a spike and the aft body is a, is a, is a is a cylinder, right? So if you if you look at the geometry, you can you can see that um, the spike cylinder is a special case of the more general uh, double cone problem, where theta one is zero degrees and and theta two is ninety degrees. So you're fixing the half angles. So from a three parameter problem, the spike cylinder becomes a single parameter problem, with lambda uh, being the um, uh, the governing parameter, which is the ratio of L two over L one. Um, all right. So um, interestingly, uh, the more general uh, double cone problem oh, looks like uh, Subramanian dropped out there. We'll just wait for him to come back. It is uh, uh, at Queensland. Uh, so um, uh, you, yes? you just dropped out there for about 10 seconds. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me uh, rewind a little bit. So going back here. Um, so I was saying that um, uh, surprisingly, the, the more general uh, three parameter problem um, uh, in this uh, regime of large scale unsteadiness has received uh, very little attention in comparison to the to the spike cylinder problem um, and uh, perhaps the only exception to that statement is this is this recent study by Hans Hornung um, uh, along with his collaborators uh, um, at University of Queensland um, Rowan Golan and, and Peter Jacobs so this was a computational study that interestingly they were working on uh, parallelly at the same time that we were doing our, our experiments and it's only later uh, when both of us submitted our papers did we get to know uh, of each other's efforts. So I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Hornung's work uh, uh, later on in, in the seminar. Um, all right, so that brings us to uh, uh, the problem that is of interest to us. So we are interested in a, a two-parameter uh, version of the of the general um, three-parameter problem. So this is the cone cylinder geometry. So we fix the second uh, uh, cone angle theta two to 90 degrees um, and play with theta one and lambda. So here's a sketch of the double cone or, or rather the, the special case of the double cone, the cone cylinder, where the first cone angle theta one and the ratio of these two lengths L2 by L1 lambda become the two governing uh, parameters. So we've uh, studied this problem experimentally um, at, at, at Mark six. Uh, all the experiments for the double cone, as well as the the cylinder that you'll uh, the cylinder wake that you'll see later, were done uh, in the Rodum Narasimha hypersonic wind tunnel, um, which is part of a research group at at IIC. So here's a here's a um, photograph of the working section of the of the wind tunnel. Um, in fact, uh, a few slides earlier when I showed you the photograph of a group, we were standing around the the test section of this wind tunnel. So this is a half a meter diameter uh, enclosed free jet. It's a standard pressure vacuum type facility where the working fluid is dry air and we can operate this facility in the Mach number range uh, six to 10. And so all the experiments that I'm going to show you today were performed at Mach six, where the, the typical operating conditions that we use are, are listed here below. So we um, um, have a stagnation pressure of around 11 bar, a stagnation temperature of 450 Kelvin, uh, which gives us a unit Reynolds number of uh, uh, 10 million uh, per meter. So these are these are uh, some typical conditions that that we run at for Mark six. Um, all right. So with that, let's let's uh, jump into the um, experimental results. Um, so what you see here is a is a is a plot of the lambda theta one parameter space. So these are the two governing geometric parameters. 
and this plot is populated with with markers. Um, now, each of these 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 markers on this plot represent uh, an individual experiment corresponding to um, that value of lambda and theta one. So the the mark number is fixed and the unit Reynolds number is fixed. All we are changing between markers is the geometry. So we are changing the combination of lambda and theta one to get uh, to move to different parts of this parameter space. So essentially, to what what we did to realize this experimentally is we machined a bunch of different cones with different half angles and lengths, and we had different base cylinders of different diameters, and then we sort of mix and match them, um, and 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 got got these uh, uh, you know uh, studied this parameter space experimentally. So in all these experiments, we did uh, high speed Schlieren and also. Uh, time result uh, pressure measurements. I'm only going to be showing the Schlieren data today because the, the pressure measurements don't uh, give us all that much more, uh, um, you know, uh, when, when compared to what the Schlieren tells us. Uh, all right. So um, we carefully looked at the, the, the Schlieren videos from, uh, from all these experiments. And with that, what the first thing that we could we could immediately infer was there are three distinct flow states for this cone cylinder problem as we uh, as we navigate this lambda theta one parameter space. So this uh, identification was done just visually uh, by looking at the Schlieren, and I'll show you some of that soon. Um, and these three states that we've identified are are uh, a case where or cases where the flow is steady, um, and um, cases where the flow is. Uh, uh, Flow is unsteady and in, in a state that we call pulsation. And the third uh, flow state is again an unsteady flow state that we call oscillation. So this terminology of uh, pulsation and oscillation is something that I'll explain in, in detail uh, shortly. Um, all right, so le now let's look at the, the, the three different flow states, steady, pulsation, and oscillation um, to see what's what's happening with this, with this uh, cone cylinder problem. Uh, all right. Let's start with the uh, with the with the so-called steady uh, flow that this this geometry generates. Now, even within the the steady flow, we can uh, subclassify the sort of the steady states of this flow into two uh, different subtypes. Uh, what we call the trivial steady flow and and the not so trivial steady flow. So let's look at the the trivial cases first because these are the the easiest to understand. So um, I want you to imagine two scenarios. Um, uh, that would lead to a sort of a quote unquote trivial flow field. So the first is where you have a very large value of lambda. So that is, uh, you know, the L2 is much greater than L1. So essentially you have a very large uh, base cylinder diameter and, and a small uh, uh, cone um, uh, jetting out in front, right? In this case, uh, from just basic gas dynamics, uh, you can imagine that the bow shock generated by this large aft body, the this, uh, the base cylinder, will stand upstream of the of the cone, and uh, the cone is nominally going to see uh, subsonic flow uh, all around, and and this is sort of uh, nominally going to be steady. So nothing uh, very interesting going on here for cases where lambda is much greater than one. Similarly, when you have when you go to the other extreme for very small values of lambda, what you have essentially is 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 flow over the is flow or a, a cone um, where at the at the trailing end of the cone you have this little bump before the flow turns over, right? So lambda much lesser than one, so L one is much greater than uh, much much greater than L two. So this is a schematic here that shows the flow scenario. So because of this little bump, you are going to get a, a small local region of uh, flow separation and a separation shock. As long as L two is much smaller than L one or L two is is small, the separation region is going to be small, and you know nothing nothing very interesting uh, goes on in the flow. So these are the 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 trivial uh, steady uh, flow states. In fact, these two uh, data markers here on the plot uh, show the cases where lambda is sufficiently small that you get this type of trivial uh, steady flow state. So now we move on to a uh, 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 slightly more interesting flow structure, which we uh, label as uh, a non-trivial uh, flow state where the flow is steady, but the, the flow structure is not, not very trivial to understand. So these are the markers that you see here in this part of the, the parameter space. So let's look at what's happening here. Uh, you know, with the help of the schematic. So these this flow corresponds to cases where you have intermediate uh, values of lambda. 
So the bow shock that is generated by the, the base cylinder falls somewhere on the, on the cone surface. So the, the, the cone leading edge generates this, this cone shock and then you have the bow shock coming in from top and then there's a shock interaction which gives rise to a transmitted shock which impinges on the cone surface. So with the adverse pressure gradient that this transmitted shock generates over the cone surface, you typically have a local flow separation. Uh, which uh, gives rise to a separation shock upstream. And in fact, uh, what you will see in practice is that the separation shock is the one that interacts with the, with the, with the bow shock. Um, and you get this uh, region of uh, flow separation as you can, as you can see in the this, in this schematic. Okay, um, so this type of shock interaction is, is, is referred to as the type four shock interaction. So if you're not if you're not familiar with the classification of different uh, shock interactions or intersection of shock waves, it's not particularly important for the purposes of this seminar. There are two things though that I would like to highlight um, in this uh, schematic uh, here. Um, firstly, you see that there is a narrow region of uh, supersonic flow uh, above the separation bubble that gets sandwiched between two regions of subsonic flow. So down here near the wall in the separation region, you have low speed reverse flow, which is subsonic. And then above it, you have this, this supersonic stream, which is called the supersonic jet colloquially. Uh, and then um, above, the, above the jet, you have subsonic flow, which is essentially the flow that is slowed down to a subsonic Mach number, the flow that passes through this relatively strong bow shock, right? So that is feature number one. The second uh, aspect about this, this flow structure that I'd like to point out is that fluid particles that go through um, you know, this cone shock and then through the series of oblique shocks, compression waves and expansion waves suffer a lower loss in stagnation pressure as compared to a fluid particle that goes through this strong bow shock. So you can, you can look at these two streamlines that are sketched in blue. Um, so the, the fluid, any fluid particle that goes through this bottom streamline suffers a lower loss in stagnation pressure as compared to a fluid particle that goes through this, this, this blue streamline on the top. And this is, you know, from basic gas dynamics, which tells you that anytime you go through a, a strong shock, a shock that is close to a normal shock, you will suffer a, a larger loss in stagnation pressure as compared to going through a series of uh, weaker shocks, uh, oblique shocks. All right. So this is an as uh, this is a uh, you know this is a aspect of the flow that I will uh, refer back to later on in my talk when we try to build a hypothesis for what triggers this large scale unsteadiness uh, in 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 the in the double cone problem. Okay. <laughs> so here's a a, a Sheeran video uh, corresponding to the experiment where theta one was thirty five degrees. Sorry, theta one was 35 degrees and lambda was 0.24. So this is this um, data point highlighted with this purple square in the parameter plot. So this shows a, a scenario where you have the non-trivial uh, steady shock wave system. So the, the features that we discussed just now using the schematic, you can now identify in this in this in this Schlieren video. So there's one important thing that uh, I would like to point out. There is some some jitter that is that is visible. Uh, right? Sorry, you just dropped out for about five six seconds. Okay. Um, uh, thanks. Let me just rewind. So there's a, there's an important uh, there's an important point that I would like to make here. Uh, you know, uh, with respect to the Sheeran video that that you can see on your screen. So we classify this flow as being nominally steady, but when you look at the video, you can you can tell that uh, you know there is some small scale unsteadiness there is jitter in in this flow um, since since we are interested in in unsteadiness that is of much larger scale for the present purposes we classify flows of this kind as being nominally steady but we do you know realize or we do acknowledge the fact that this these flows are strictly not not steady in fact uh, flows of this kind, uh, you know, this kind of SBLI type unsteadiness have received a lot of attention in literature, particularly uh, uh, in, in the high enthalpy flow regime. So with that disclaimer, um, you know, for the present purposes, we, we classify this as, as a steady flow. 
Um, all right. So now let's move on to the two um, unsteady uh, flow states that I that we identify from Schlieren. So the first is what we call pulsations. So here's an example of of, uh, of flow being in this pulsation state. Um, where um, theta one is 25 degrees and lambda is 0.48. So that is this uh, data marker here. Um, and as you can see from, from the Schlieren video, uh, there is uh, you know the large amplitude periodic motion of the shockwave system and the separated flow region is, is readily evident um, from, from, from the Schlieren video. Right? So this is in sharp contrast to the, to the nominally steady case that you saw just on just a little while ago on the previous slide. Um, so um, these these pulsation type unsteadiness uh, have a have a very def uh, definite time period. So these 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 flows are uh, very uh, sort of uh, strongly periodic. You can you can tell that qualitatively by just looking at the Schlieren videos, but you can also do uh, more uh, quantitative analysis to you know sort of confirm that. Right, and again, I'd like to uh, reiterate here that uh, these are uh, self-sustained. Uh, uh, this this unsteadiness in the flow is self-sustained, so the geometry is fixed and the inflow is fixed. So we do not uh, trigger this unsteadiness, or we do not uh, force this unsteadiness externally in any which way. So this unsteadiness is is self-sustained by the flow. Um, and I would also like to point out that uh, you know this um, this unsteadiness uh, happens at you know fairly large frequencies. So, for instance, this particular uh, experiment with theta one twenty five degrees and lambda point four eight, um, these pulsation pulsations happen about uh, thirteen hundred uh, times in one second. So, fairly large uh, frequency when you when you consider the the, the scale of this this unsteadiness, right? So uh, very interesting flow, and and um, you know we spent hours uh, looking at these these Schlieren videos to understand what's going on. Um, all right, um, so that takes me to the second kind of uh, or the other unsteady flow state, which we label as uh, which we simply label as oscillations. So here's an example for a flow oscillations where theta one is 15 degrees and lambda is 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 point. Um, point two. So this this data marker here, right? Again, um, when you look at this Schlieren video at the bottom, you see that there is uh, coherent unsteadiness in the flow. But uh, uh, even qualitatively, the unsteadiness is very different from the pulsation type unsteadiness that you see on the on the top video, right? So here, the the spatial scale of the unsteadiness is much smaller. So you essentially have small amplitude oscillations or small amplitude undulations in the in the in this uh, separation shock wave uh, structure, um, again for these flows, as I will I will uh, explain later, we can pick out a, a coherent time scale. Um, so for this example, um, the the oscillations are happening at around two thousand five hundred hertz. Um, all right. So now that we have classified uh, the flow into three states, uh, the most interesting question um, uh, that we ask is why does the flow pulsate at all? Right, so why does the flow pulsate? What what causes or what triggers this uh, very large scale um, um, unsteadiness? Um, the way we uh, we answer that um, question is, is 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 the following. So we do a a, a little uh, thought experiment. So we start um, in a region of this parameter space where the flow is steady. So this is a, you know a non-trivial sort of steady flow state. So for instance, you can take uh, this point here where theta one is 35 degrees and lambda is 0.45, right? And then we look at the flow structure as we move from that point in the parameter space into a region where the flow uh, executes pulsations. So uh, to make it simple, we will uh, fix theta one and, and reduce lambda starting from this value of 0.45 uh, at theta one is 35 degrees down into this region where the flow goes into pulsations, right? And then we will uh, try and understand how the flow structure changes as you're reducing uh, lambda to see if we can uh, uh, come up with a physical explanation for what triggers a uh, pulsation. So this is the this is the um, argument here. So I'll use these two uh, two sketches um, uh, for this discussion. So on the left here is theta one is 35 degrees, lambda 0.45. Right, so this marker here, and on the right is the same theta one, but we are now looking at a, a lower value of lambda, something less than 0.45. Right, so and we make comparisons between uh, the flow structures on the left and the right. 
Um, okay, so since we fixed theta one, the way we can, uh, um, um, uh, since we fix theta one and reduce lambda, the way we can understand these two geometries is the following. So imagine it is the same four body cone um, and moving from left to right, all we are doing is we are switching the arc body cylinder with a smaller diameter cylinder. So that is what is um, happening as you go from uh, left to right. So one thing that you can, you can uh, sort of readily see is that when you reduce lambda, the, the bow shock that is generated by the aft, aft body, that is a cylinder, will move downstream because now you have, as you reduce lambda, now you have a smaller cylinder so that the dimensional standoff distance, uh, uh, you know, that, that is the, the dimensional length uh, reduces so the bow shock moves downstream. So what that means is this triple point. So that is the, the interaction point between the separation shock, the bow shock and the transmitted shock uh, also moves downstream and moves further away from the cone axis. So this is purely a geometric effect, uh, which you can see uh, with the help of these uh, three uh, reference lines that you that I've just brought on screen. So the, the triple point moves um, downstream and also moves further away from the cone axis by, by some distance, let's say uh, Delta R. Okay, so what this means is that the transmitted shock now impinges on the cone surface at a location closer to the cone base. Okay, so if you um, now uh, write down the or, or denote the distance between the impingement location of the transmitted shock and the cone base, uh, for lambda 0.45, let's call it delta L1. Uh, when you reduce lambda, the delta L2 is going to be less than delta L1. Again, purely a geometric effect because the bow shock has, has moved downstream. Um, all right. So now the argument I'm going to make uh, is uh, drives at uh, understanding the qualitative changes in the adverse pressure gradient that gets generated uh, on the cone surface in this region where the shock train, uh, where the shock train sits. Okay. So now from the geometry, we clearly see that uh, delta L2 is lesser than delta L1. Now let's look at what's happening with the, with the pressure in this region. So if you denote the, uh, the stagnation pressure in this base region as, as P01 for the case with lambda 0.45 and some value P02 when you reduce lambda below 0.45, um, now we use the argument, uh, but now we use the, uh, you know, the, the flow, the aspect of the flow that I pointed out earlier, which is that when you, uh, when you consider the loss in stagnation pressure of two fluid particles, one going through the, the system of the bow, uh, oblique shock waves versus one that goes through the strong uh, bow shock, the fluid particle get, that goes through the um, series of oblique shock waves suffers a lower loss in stagnation pressure, right? So when you recollect that, that detail here, you'll see that moving from left to right, that is when you reduce lambda, a larger fraction of the incoming uh, flow is now passing through the series of these oblique shocks, right? That's again, purely a geometric effect because the triple point has now moved further away from the cone axis. So going from left to right, you have a larger mass fraction of the incoming flow that is going through the series of oblique shocks as compared to the mass fraction that is going through this strong bow shock. So now what that means is you have a larger mass of fluid that is coming to this base region with, with a relatively lower loss in stagnation pressure. So you can make the argument that uh, P02 is, has to be uh, higher than P01 or at the very least P02 cannot be less than P01, right? So that is, that is a physical argument. So now when you consider, you know, the average magnitude of the pressure gradient uh, over this delta L, you can write, uh, you know, uh, the stagnation pressure at the base uh, minus the static pressure at the, at the, at the transmitted shock location uh, by delta is the average magnitude of the pressure gradient. And from the arguments that I just presented, you can, you can conclude that the magnitude of the adverse pressure gradient will increase as you reduce lambda. Okay, so now what that means is when you start at this, at this value of lambda 0.45 and begin to reduce lambda, your adverse pressure gradient magnitude on the surface is continually increasing. And you can imagine at some critical value of that adverse pressure gradient, flow separation is going to kick in on the surface of the cone, right? Large scale flow separation when that, when that adverse pressure gradient is, is strong enough. 
So that is what we think uh, takes the flow from this steady uh, flow state to the pulsation flow state. So that large scale flow reversal and separation in this region of the cone surface is what we think is the trigger for pulsation. Okay. Now, once that large scale flow separation happens, then we can uh, we can sort of uh, explain um, you know what what it leads to in the sense that then how does the flow pulsate once you go into the pulsation regime. Well, um, the Schlieren videos are, are, are very um, helpful in, in understanding this, 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 this pulsation dynamics. So we can sort of split the, the pulsation cycle into three, three uh, uh, phases. So the first phase is uh, large growth of separation region. So now you moved from the steady uh, flow state into the pulsation region, and you have a strong enough adverse pressure gradient that generates large flow separation region on the cone surface. And this separation region is, is continually grow, growing because there is continuous uh, mass accumulation, right? So with that, because you have this, this uh, unsteady separation region that is growing in time, the shock structure upstream of the separated flow is continually deforming, as you can see in the, in the Schlieren video. So, so you have mass accumulation in the separation region. So the incoming uh, high speed flow is effectively seeing a, a bluffer body. It doesn't shear sh sharp cone, but it sees sort of a bluff body. So that's why you see this de <laughs> deformation of the of the shock wave, right? You don't you don't it it doesn't always remain a nice cone shock. It starts to deform as the separation region grows. Okay, so. Once you have, uh, you know, the separation region attaining its its sort of the the largest size that it does in a cycle. So that is, um, you know, at this let's let's look at this video carefully now at the top left. So at 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 about this instant, right? So you have a large region of, of flow separation. So essentially, what you get instantaneously is is almost a, a complete bow shock, right? Now at this instant, um, you see that the sonic line. Uh, that forms that that you have uh, over the over the shoulder uh, um, or the sonic surface in three dimensions uh, has the largest cross section area right instantaneously in, in uh, over the entire cycle. So again, basic gas dynamics. So this is basically it, it acts like a throat. So when your throat area is the maximum, you get the the maximum mass flow rate. So at this instant, you have the mass maximum mass efflux from this from this separated flow region. So because now you have rapid mass efflux or depletion, uh, this this leads to the collapse of this 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 entire separated flow region. And again, the the cycle begins again. So you have a collapse of this separated flow region. You have the transmitted shock which impinges on the cone surface. You have a strong enough pressure gradient that leads again to this this large scale. A flow reversal event. So this is a, a self-sustained uh, cycle in that way. <laughs> All right. So I want to quickly show you um, uh, some more uh, uh, videos of pulsation for different values of uh, theta and lambda. So now uh, on the right here is 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 a lower value of lambda. So it's the same theta of twenty five degrees, but lower value of lambda. <laughs> Qualitatively, you get uh, very similar looking flow structures, but the non-dimensional uh, time scales for for the for the pulsations are different as as you would imagine so here's a, a third example with the even lower value of lambda now you see that uh, qualitatively the the pulsation looks um, uh, fairly different from what you see on the top left right it's the same it's the same mechanism that that drives the flow and steadiness but the qualitative features are are very different and on the bottom left is is an extreme example um, where you have a larger value of theta. So now we have theta 35 degrees and a fairly low value of uh, lambda 0.11. So this is right at the cusp of the flow going from pulsation state to an oscillation state, right? But it is still in, in, in the pulsation state. So this is, uh, this is interesting because in this case on the bottom left, you actually don't have this, this large scale deformation of the, of the separation shock into a bow shock, right? But, but nonetheless, you, you do get this, uh, it's the same mechanism at play, and you do uh, see uh, pulsations. Um, all right, so that is the story with uh, with pulsations. But before I I move uh, into oscillations, I I just like to come back to this the this paper uh, by um, by Hornung et al. that I that I mentioned earlier in the talk. 
Uh, so, like I said, um, um, Hans, uh, Rowan, and Peter, they, they looked at this um, a double cone problem, a computationally fairly extensive study where they, where they changed theta 1, theta 2, and lambda to understand what's going on with the flow. And they, they look at the unsteadiness, they take a, a, a vorticity viewpoint to, to explain this unsteadiness. For me, the most interesting takeaway from, from this paper is this, is this uh, very neat numerical experiment that they do. Where they, where they look at the flow for this combination of uh, theta one, theta two and lambda. So this is essentially a, a, a spike cylinder, but they do an inviscid flow computation. So they, they turn off viscosity, right? But what they do in addition to the, uh, you know, turning off viscosity is they introduce a slight bluntness at the, at the nose of the, of the spike. Right. So what that does is locally uh, you get a curved shock because of the uh, because of the uh, slight bluntness. Locally you get shock curvature at the at the at the spike uh, near the uh, upstream of the uh, nose, and that introduces some vorticity um, uh, into the into the flow. Right. So this is again basic di uh, gas dynamics. When you have curved shocks, you get uh, vorticity uh, generation. Right. So this is an otherwise inviscid flow, but they introduce a small amount of vorticity into the into the flow by by this little bluntness. And what they see is uh, by doing that, they can recreate this uh, this large scale pulsation exactly uh, as it would be if the flow if this were a viscous uh, uh, flow. Right, so then the argument is that they present is you know it is essentially the vorticity in the flow that is uh, causing this this large scale unsteadiness. So you have vorticity that is injected into the flow at the leading edge, and then it accumulates in into a, a growing vortex ring around the around the spike, and then it grows and at at some point in the cycle it's grown large enough that the vortex ring essentially escapes around the shoulder, and then the the cycle begins again. Right, so. This vorticity viewpoint um, is fairly easy to reconcile with what what I uh, what I presented in terms of the flow reversal. When you realize that the region of reverse flow is essentially nothing but a growing vortex ring, it has the same sign of vorticity. So what we think of as flow reversal and mass accumulation is nothing but uh, growth of vorticity around the cone or the or the spike. Right. So these two uh, so viewpoints are, are, are consistent with one another. Um, all right, so let me quickly go into uh, the other uh, kind of uh, flow um, and steadiness, which is oscillations. Again, we ask the same question, why does the flow oscillate at all? And we play the same game. Uh, we start um, in the region of the flow where the, uh, in the region of the parameter space where the flow is steady to begin with. And then we work ourselves into uh, the adjacent region where the flow oscillates and see and, 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 and think about what's happening, uh, what is the change that is coming about in the flow structure, right? So here we have to begin with a case where lambda is much smaller than one. So this is one of the uh, quote unquote trivial uh, steady states that I talked about earlier. So you can imagine say this marker here. Uh, so you have a, a very small bump um, at the at the trailing end of this cone before the flow turns over, and this is going to generate a small region of separated flow, right? Um, as long as this bump is not too large, this this separated flow region is going to be steady, and nothing uh, nothing very exciting goes on. But now, if you start increasing lambda, so that is you stay at a fixed given value of theta and start increasing lambda. So for a given cone, um, um, you know, if you if you imagine the four body cone is fixed, you are increasing the base cylinder diameter. So this this the height of this bump goes up, um, and then what happens is the 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 length of this uh, separation bubble will will scale with with this height, right? Because this this height basically um, sets the length scale for you know the the nesting of this separation bubble. So the separation bubble length uh, scales with this with this with this height uh, with L two. Um, and then as you increase L2, the separation uh, bubble is, uh, the extent of the separation bubble is going to grow. Now, you have a supersonic shear layer that, that forms above the separation bubble. So inside the separation bubble, the flow is, is, is reversed, it, it's, it's subsonic, and above that you have supersonic flow. So you have a supersonic shear layer. Now, as the separation bubble length increases with L2, uh, the development length for that supersonic shear layer also increases, right? So the development length for the shear layer scales with, with lambda. And now you can imagine for a sufficiently large value of lambda, you have enough of development length in that shear layer that 
instabilities in the shear layer will naturally begin to set in right and that is what we think the instabilities in the shear layer is what we think drive these these flow oscillations uh, so here's an example um, of, of flow oscillations for uh, theta one is is 25 degrees and lambda equal to 0.11. So some of these flow features that I talked about just now uh, can be identified uh, in this clear in video. So you have um, a cone shock that is generated at the nose and then you have this region of flow separation. So this separation shock angle is larger than the cone shock angle and that takes over. So you have the separation shock and you have this region of uh, you know separated flow. And the shear layer is clearly visible uh, in, in this video. So that is where you see this sharp intensity change going from dark to light. So that is the, the shear layer. And in the video, you can see that uh, starting at the separation point, this shear layer is, is, uh, is relatively steady uh, to some extent. And, and at this location here, there is a rapid onset of instabilities and the shear layer breaks down. So once you have this, this <laughs> This large growth of vertical disturbances in the shear layer that also induces undulations in the in the separation shock wave structure. So, in essence, uh, the oscillations are primarily uh, driven by instabilities in the shear layer um, that forms over the corner uh, separation bubble. All right. So, one of the uh, um, you know very interesting things that we found in in the study of this uh, oscillation type uncertainty is is the following. So, we we saw that there actually uh, two different types of oscillations that occur. So the, the first is what we call, um, you know, what we labeled as free oscillation. So I'll, I'll talk about that for a minute here. So look at this example for uh, where theta one is 15 degrees and lambda 0 0.08, right? So if you watch this Schlieren video carefully, you can see that the separation point is, is executing periodic excursions back and forth along the cone surface. So watch this, this separation uh, point here, and you can see that it executes periodic excursions back and forth, right? So <laughs> to make that sort of easier to see, what I show here on the right are two still images um, at different phases in the oscillation cycle where the phase difference between the two images uh, is roughly 180 degrees. So they're uh, roughly out of phase. Okay, so the separation point in the top image is marked as S and in the bottom image, it's S dash. And this location where the shear layer uh, instability is set in is marked as T here and T dash in the bottom image. So here are two reference lines to, to help you see the difference. So you can see that S has this uh, significant excursion length, right? Uh, between these two, two images. And similarly, uh, T also moves uh, downstream uh, as you go to the other, like, you know, as you are in the other half of the, go to the other half of the cycle. Okay, so uh, we call, you know, we label this type of oscillation as free oscillation simply because the separation point um, is free to move along the cone surface. Now compare this with the other type of oscillation that, that we saw, which is uh, what we call as anchored oscillations. So in this case, now we have a, a larger value of lambda where uh, lambda is now large enough that it pushes the separation point all the way to the, the nose of the cone and the separation point remains anchored there as you can as you can see in this video right so this is qualitatively a different mode of um, oscillation as compared to uh, the free oscillation in fact the the differences between the two oscillation types also manifest in a quantitative manner which we will come to in 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 one or two slides um, all right. So again, here uh, I'm showing two still images for the flow, uh, roughly separated by 180 degrees in phase. So you can see that um, uh, you know from these images as well as the video, the separation point remains anchored at the at the at the at the tip at the cone tip, um, but the the separation shock angle is is continually varying. Right? You can you can see that easily in this in this video. So the local separation angle. At, at the at the nose is is continually changing, and you'll also note that the the location where the shear layer uh, transition happens T is also again executing this sort of back and forth um, oscillations through the cycle, right? Now the motion in T is now happening for a different reason um, as compared to the previous case of pre oscillations. So here uh, uh, what's happening is that because the local uh, shock angle at the nose is continually changing 
uh, what that does is the the Mach number downstream of that separation shock is also continually changing as the flow as it goes through this oscillation cycle. So since the Mach number is changing, the stability characteristics of the shear layer are also continuously getting altered, and that is what makes this point T, uh, uh, you know, perform these excursions along the shear layer uh, length as you go through one uh, oscillation cycle. Okay. So very interesting uh, flow dynamics. All right. So uh, we spent some time, um, you know, looking at these videos and, and trying to come up with a physical picture of uh, what's going on with this flow. And then uh, once we're convinced that we had a sufficiently good physical understanding of, of flow oscillations, we wanted to, to see if we can come up with a simple model that quantitatively describes um, uh, the flow. So the quantitative, uh, uh, you know, the, the quantitative parameter that is of interest to us is, is the is the uh, screw hole number, right? So the the time scale associated with these uh, oscillations. Now, um, in this parameter uh, uh, plot here, um, I further demarcated the oscillation regime into two parts. So the the blue markers here are the free oscillations, and the red markers here are the anchored uh, oscillations. Okay. Now, for each of these, we we we, we analyze each of these high-speed clearance videos corresponding to each data marker, and we uh, subjected subjected it to uh, spectral proper orthogonal decomposition. So this was done to extract, uh, uh, you know, objectively a time scale for these oscillations. So here I'm going to skip all the details of uh, SPOD because this is uh, now a fairly standard uh, technique. Uh, so essentially, what it does is 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 throw out a, a frequency uh, for each of these uh, oscillation cases, uh, and you know, so that it it essentially allows us to uh, uh, quantitatively extract a time scale for oscillations, right? So we construct this non-dimensional frequency uh, using the first cone length L one and pre-stream velocity, which I call the screw hole number. So the screw hole number is now plotted here against this. Uh, mixed parameter uh, sine theta one over lambda. So this this mixed parameter combines the two geometric parameters. Okay, so the blue markers are free oscillations, the red markers are uh, anchored oscillations, um, and this single gray marker here is what we call you know the transitional case. So this is an interesting case where the the flow is for a part of the oscillation cycle it is uh, you know the separation point is free to move about and for for the rest of the cycle it gets anchored at the nose so it has sort of this mixed characteristic so we call it a transitional case because it's the flow is in the process of transitioning from free to anchored oscillation so when you look at the the scaling of the screw hole number you again see that um, you'll you'll see that there uh, you know it throws out a difference a quantitative difference between the pre oscillations and the anchored oscillation so the free oscillations seem to have follow this trend line, and when the flow goes to an anchored oscillation state, there's there's a jump, and then the trend suggests that it, it there's there's an offset. Okay, so now uh, you know. Let me uh, very quickly uh, summarize the the simple model that we built to sort of predict this uh, predict this true hall number, right? So this is the physical picture that we have. So like I said. Um, oscillations are driven by disturbances in the shear layer. So you have shear layer that goes unsteady and you have disturbances that propagate down to the shear layer. And it, uh, this unsteady shear layer impinges on the shoulder here. And then that sets off acoustic disturbances in the flow, which can propagate upstream through this subsonic separated flow region. And we think that these acoustic disturbances, uh, you know, sort of lock in this oscillation frequency. So the, these acoustic disturbances provide the feedback, and then uh, the flow locks into a particular time scale or a frequency. So this is a, a physical picture that we have. So now to model this, uh, we we are after a velocity scale. You uh, see, for the uh, propagation, uh, you know, for velocity scale for the disturbance propagation in the shear layer, and you know the the velocity scale for the for the acoustic feedback right now to get a velocity scale for the disturbance propagation one can always do a formal linear stability analysis of the supersonic uh, shear layer but we took a, a simpler approach so we um, we found a model in in literature for uh, from Otel Sen et al where they were looking at uh, supersonic jets and their interest was you know in understanding the the mark angle uh, you know of disturbances that come from these jets but in their work, they had a, a very simple model um, that allows you to readily work out uh, velocity scale for this disturbance propagation. In fact, you can get you get three uh, independent velocity scales for this uh, supersonic uh, shear layer. 
what is labeled as a uh, supersonic mode, um, the subsonic mode, and 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 the Kelvin um, uh, Helmholtz mode. Right. Oops. Sorry. Um, all right. So that's the model we use for uh, getting the UC, and then for this acoustic feedback, uh, we uh, go back to you know the classic work by Roster. Uh, where they looked at tones from acoustic tones from cavities, and that's what we use for for the feedback, right? So we combine these two models, and now uh, what you'll see is um, you know the results from our from our model. So these dashed lines are our model predictions, uh, you know, independent of the experimental measurement. So the bottom line is when we uh, you know use the subsonic velocity scale uh, to predict this true hall number, and the top line is when we use the supersonic velocity scale. So you'll see that for a for a very simple for a fairly simple model of this kind, the match between the the model predictions and the experimental data is is, is quite impressive. So for the free oscillations, it looks like the subsonic uh, you know velocity propagation scale is the one that sets the the sets the feedback. Um, and you can see that this curve, you know, actually predicts this this trend line. The experimental data points pretty well. And for the supersonic case, uh, sorry, for the for the anchored oscillations, it appears that the supersonic, you know, disturbance velocity scale is the one that takes over and and sets the true hole number. Okay, so we were quite um, you know thrilled to see you know a simple model like this actually uh, predict the predict the experimental data. Um, all right. So that is the story with the with the double cones. Uh, let me see how am I doing on time. Can I take ten more minutes, Vishal? Uh, yeah, no worries. So from... All right. Okay, good. So this is the second part of the talk. We move from double cones to cylinders, but this is a this is a shorter part of the talk. Um, okay. So um, uh, you know, like you all know very well. Uh, the flow in the wake of a cylinder is, is a very classic problem in, in, in fluid dynamics in, in the low speed or subsonic regime. So if you go look at literature, there, there are literally hundreds of papers on subsonic cylinder wakes, if not, if not thousands, right? But surprisingly, what we found is when you look at this same canonical problem in the high speed regime, there is very little work that looks at the unsteady aspect of, of uh, cylinder wakes in, 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 at, at high speeds. So this work by Schmidt and Shepard in 2015 at Mark IV is, is from to the best of our knowledge, the first piece of work that identified coherent unsteadiness in the wake of a high speed cylinder. So we decided there's, there's, there's enough interesting um, fluid dynamics here and, and, and very little of it has been explored. So we wanted to get into this, this problem ourselves. So, so Premika set up uh, these really nice experiments of cylinder wakes um, at Mark VI. So note that uh, Schmidt and Shepard, their experiments were at Mark IV, and what we did um, is at Mark VI. So here's a high-speed uh, Schlieren video uh, from our experiments, and here's a schematic of the flow. So just to quickly run you through the, the key flow features, uh, as you would imagine, there, there'll be a nice bow shock that sits um, upstream of the cylinder, and the flow turns around the cylinder, and then you have um, you know the separation shock and the tail shock, which uh, eventually make the streamlines parallel to the to the free stream, so you get this large regions of uh, large region of flow separation in in the wake. So you essentially have uh, uh, two lobes of um, vorticity with with the opposing sign, one sitting at the top and 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 one sitting at the bottom. So these these large recirculation regions, and outside the recirculation region, you have supersonic flow. So again, you get a, a supersonic uh, shear layer. So this region uh, in the wake where the where the two supersonic shear layers collide is, um, you know, uh, colloquially referred to as as the neck um, of the wake. So that is highlighted here in this in this uh, yellow box, right? So you can see from this from the Schlieren video that there there seems to be you know some coherence in in in, in the unsteadiness, and that is what we will uh, we will actually extract. Okay, so we did a set of six experiments. Uh, where we had um, uh, cylinder models of two different diameters, 30 and 50 millimeters. Um, and we uh, changed the Reynolds number of the flow by uh, by playing around with, with the uh, stagnation pressure in the winter. So we have um, six different uh, Reynolds numbers, RED, based on the cylinder diameter. So this uh, Roche Lehren video here corresponds to the case of, um, uh, corresponds to the case that is highlighted in this, with this red box. Um, all right. So again, we use um, 
SPOD uh, to extract uh, a coherent time scale for the oscillations in the wake. Uh, so here's the uh, you know uh, SPOD spectrum for this case, uh, which shows that you know at a, a non-dimensional value of 0.36 to all number of 0.36, there's a clear peak in the spectrum. So that uh, objectively allows us to to infer uh, that allows us to objectively infer a time scale for these uh, for these oscillations. So we did the SPOD for all, all six cases. Again, I'm skipping the SPOD details. Uh, but what I'd like to show here is actually this, this nice uh, reconstruction um, where, uh, you know, on top you have the raw Schlieren video. This is what we get from our high speed camera. And then we apply SPOD. We, we take out all the uh, quote unquote, you know, we take out all the decoherence uh, from the flow. So we just do a reconstruction with the mean flow and with the first mode. And here you have this very nice, um, flapping motion of the wake, uh, you know, almost hypnotic that, that clearly comes out uh, from this analysis. Um, all right. So um, now let's look at uh, what the Struh Hall number tells us. So here's a plot of the Struh Hall number um, uh, from both the experiments. So the red markers are, 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 are the present study at Mark 6, and the gray markers are uh, from Schmidt and Shepard at Mark 4. So this is Struh Hall number uh, with respect to cylinder diameter versus the Reynolds number with respect to the cylinder diameter RED. So you can readily see that there's a, there's a very clear Mach number influence in this true hall number um, behavior. So in this region where there's a overlap of the Reynolds number between the two experiments, the true hall number does not match because now these are experiments at different Mach numbers. Ours is at Mach 6, Schmidt and Schubert Mach 4, so that Mach number effect clearly manifests in the in the true hall number data. So, uh, this is not the complete story. Now we do, we construct this true hall number uh, in a slightly different manner. So we define another true hall number, which is denoted as ST sub S. And instead of using the cylinder diameter as the length scale, we use the length of the shear layer S as the length scale to form this true hall number. So frequency times the shear layer length by the free stream velocity. Okay. Now this scaling of true hall number was proposed by Schmidt and Shepard. Again, the, the sort of the physical motivation there was, uh, you know, disturbances propagate through the shear layer and there is acoustic feedback again through this recirculation region. So, so they argue that this is the governing length for, that sets the, the oscillation frequency, right? So now let's look at the screw hall number um, data, uh, uh, with the screw hall number constructed using the shear layer length S. So this is STS versus RED. So this plot tells you a very different story, right? So firstly, you see that uh, in both the data sets, there's no systematic trend of STS versus RED, right? So, so what we have here is a sort of universal behavior. And also the screw hall number, uh, so the universal screw hall number that was uh, you know, proposed by Schmidt and Shepard is 0.48. And what we see in our data is 0.49. So there's a very close match uh, between the two values. So the, the, the conclusion from, from, from this plot is the following. So there is clearly a universality of this true hall number with respect to the Reynolds number because you don't see a systematic trend um, in either of these uh, data sets when, when you look at the true hall number with respect to Reynolds number. Further, because the true hall numbers at two different mark numbers are very close, there's a very good match. It also tells you that the universality extends to the mark number as well. So the true hall number is not only universal with uh, the true hall number not only exhibits universal behavior with respect to Reynolds number, it also exhibits universality with respect to Mach number, at least in the range, uh, Mach number range four to six. So that is that is something uh, very interesting. Uh, all right. Um, so since uh, you know uh, the true hall number scaling works very well. Uh, which is based on the hypothesis of this uh, this acoustic feedback through this subsonic region. We are curious to see if we can pick out uh, you know the the frequency the the near wake oscillation frequency at these separation points, right? So what we did in our experiments is we threw in uh, uh, two Q light sensors. So these are fast response miniature pressure sensors at at the top and the bottom flow separation points, and did uh, you know time resolved pressure measurements. Okay, so here's the power spectral density from, from, from the pressure measurements at these three different uh, Reynolds numbers. And again, not very surprisingly, you do see a peak at the, at the frequency corresponding to the 
coherent uh, oscillations in in the near wake right so this this data tells us that there is indeed a pressure signature of this or there is indeed a signature of this frequency when you look at the pressure values at the separation separation points now since we have this uh, this time loss all pressure data uh, what it allows us to do is is look at the phase relationship between disturbances at the top and bottom shear layers right so we ran a simple cross correlation between the top and the bottom uh, pressure signals now if you look, if you consider the the symmetry the geometric sim symmetry in the problem between the top and the bottom halves uh, you can quite easily argue that the phase relationship between disturbances in the in the two halves can either have a value of 0 or 180 degrees right so the disturbances can either be uh, in phase or they have to be completely out of phase so symmetric or anti symmetric there's no other possibility right so when you look at the cross correlation coefficient you see that for all three Reynolds numbers the peak in the value of cross correlation cross correlation coefficient is 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 close to 0.5 which tells us that <laughs> that oscillatory activity between the top and the bottom uh, separation points is out of phase um, uh, with uh, one another so this is a feature of the flow that is very similar to or that is uh, you know that is the same as the low speed counterpart so when you look at a low speed cylinder wake you have vortex shedding in the top and the bottom halves happening at a phase difference of 180 degrees so similar thing happens uh, in the high speed wake as well all right so that brings me to the end of the uh, the presentation so these are some quick takeaways um uh, from the talk so what i'll do is i'll just let this uh, keep this slide on the screen and and just jump to questions since i'm since i'm already over over time yeah thank you thanks for your attention Thanks, Subramaniam. Uh, excellent talk and very cool uh, student videos there. Uh, I'll open it up for questions. So uh, anyone from the audience, please feel free to unmute uh, and ask your questions or if you want, just put it in the chat. Yeah, Connor, go ahead. Hi, thanks for the great talk. That was really interesting. Um, I just got a question about the double cone experiment um, and your mention of the pressure transducers, your pressure measurements. Um, you mentioned that the, the physical sort of system, you had like this qualitative explanation. What pressure measurements did you take and, and did they agree with that prediction about how the mm. unsteady shock motion? Worked? Okay, that's a good question. So, um, our pressure measurements were only done at 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 one point in the flow. So in in some of these experiments, we um, we stuck a Q light pressure transducer on the cylinder face here, um, and that was just to sort of double check that the frequency that we are getting from our Schlieren um, it was more of a sanity check that it it matches with the pressure fluctuations that we see on the cylinder face, right? Uh, so these were only single point uh, time to solve pressure measurements. Uh, more as a sanity check, um, but what we are trying to do um, in order to sort of validate our hypothesis uh, for this adverse pressure gradient, uh, you know, being the trigger for pulsations, is we've been trying to do some um, um, some LES slash DNS of this flow, where we can very carefully look at the pressure gradients on the surface. So one could also uh, instrument the cone with sufficiently large number of pressure transducers to to make these 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 measurements but we are trying out some some computations to 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 get at that so Thanks. the short answer is our pressure measurements as of today does not allow us to um you know validate the hypothesis but we are working on yeah. it yeah looking forward to seeing that thank you yeah thanks thanks uh, uh, i had one um yeah. i'm just wondering uh, how would the uh, the stall number plot for the pulsation uh, flow state look like when if you plot right. it uh, in the same way um, as you did for the oscillation okay so um oh, and i wish i let me check if i have that in my backup slides unfortunately no okay so um uh, the short answer is we haven't spent uh, very much time looking at the at the at the, at the, at the detailed scaling of the at the pulsations mm -hmm. the stall number for pulsations so when we just do a, a plot versus one of these uh, you know sort of mixed sort of parameters it doesn't throw up a clear trend 
but we guess that there is something more uh, you know there is there's a lot more hiding in the data it's just that we've not we've not yet had a chance to look at that in in as much detail as we did pulsations so that is again that is that is again something that is uh, you know uh, work in progress all right okay because I, yeah. I was expecting that it might show a more spread in the stall number value and compared to what you see in the oscillation. Yeah. So we, we do report this. We just report the screw hall mm -hmm. uh, number values in our paper in, in, in that mm -hmm. in the JFM paper. Uh, but we don't we don't say very much about it. Uh, we just report it. Um, oh. Yeah. But uh, we, we did try, you know, some sort of mixed geometric parameter scaling to see if, you know, we can get a quick collapse. Yeah. But it, it didn't it didn't pay off so that you know that made us realize that you know we'll have to work harder to to explain that yeah, yes. and and build a build a physical model that you know sort of can predict that slow all number yeah, which we yeah. hope we will do soon yeah, that would be very interesting uh, to know how yes. that uh, yeah. uh, looks like yeah uh, uh, just just another question as we were while we're just waiting for others uh, to make up their minds uh, I, I was very uh, intrigued by uh, well, when you said that you use the shear layer length as mm -hmm. uh, the characteristic length scale, how do you how do you estimate it? So that is directly from our shear length. So let me go back here. Uh, this is for the cylinder wake, right? Your question yes. is yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, in this one, yeah, yeah. So this is you know directly from our shear length. So we can clearly identify the 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 separation point. Um, you know, so the start of the shear layer is is the separation yeah. point so that we can get from our shear length. And then the end point is is slightly iffy because we you know uh, we played around with with values of s going all the way to the center line and slightly mm -hmm. off, right. Mm -hmm. um, but what we see is it doesn't make all that much of a difference uh, when it comes to you know the final screw hole number value. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Because I uh, I always uh, maybe thought of uh, thought that the shear layer thickness. Would be mm -hmm. a more uh, you know, intuitive uh, length scale. Uh, yeah, that so, you choose. So I guess it depends on it depends on the uh, phenomena the that you're trying to explain. So in this case, because uh, it again seems to be you know some kind of acoustic feedback that is sustaining mm -hmm. these oscillations, the acoustic waves are traveling upstream in this separated flow region, mm -hmm. right? And the propagation length is, is sort of set by the shear layer yeah, length. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, so that uh, that is the argument essentially that Schmidt and Shepard make, and um, it works very well. Uh, like when when we saw this, you know, this plot when we yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we're yeah, quite impressed by yeah. how how well it works. No, it's, it's <laughs> very interesting. Man. That's it's it's quite something. But uh, I mean, overall, I think uh, it's it's very similar to uh, the the resonance feedback that you get in supersonic impinging jets, right? Uh, in in, yeah, in yeah. your case, it's a, it's a more um, what do you say uh, specific geometric conditions where if you can uh, just yeah. have let's say L one to be um, let's say zero, you'd just mm -hmm. you'd just get uh, a flat plate impingement. Right. Right. Yeah. So so that's right. So essentially, it's you know this there is this interaction between so the broad theme really between the two problems is the the unsteadiness is the broad connection is that the unsteadiness in both these flows is, is because of the interaction between the shock waves and these uh, and the regions of the flow where there's large separation and you have the right, shear yeah. that form so there are disturbances that that go through the shear layer and then there's some kind of acoustic feedback that gets set up yes so of course for the pulsations it's very different so it's 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 much more sort of la brutal large scale unsteadiness yes, yeah. but for the in the, the oscillations in the double cone problem as well as the cylinder wake there are there are definitely similarities yeah absolutely yeah. all right uh, excellent so if we have no more questions then uh, please join yeah, me and thank you subramanian for an excellent talk uh, and very interesting re research work there yeah, th thanks. Thanks oh, again sorry. for the So, can do you have I a question? Saw, I saw Jimmy. Jimmy Philip was was online, and oh, yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. a, a tough yeah. question from him, but he logged off. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the invitation. I I, I really enjoyed uh, giving this talk, and and it's it's a wonderful seminar series. I'm just looking at the list of talks on Absolutely. on your YouTube channel is it's fantastic. I think it's a great great resource for the entire fluid mechanics, the global fluid mechanics community. So okay. I, I really have to commend the organizers for, for, for doing
doing all this. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. It's really encouraging. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.